Howdy, I'm uh, Dr. Greg Church with the uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service located in Collin County, Texas. I'm going to give a brief presentation on irrigation, primarily for use in agricultural production. Agricultural use of water in Texas accounts for about 60% of water use in Texas, and it's important that we try to utilize the most efficient use of that water as possible. As drought affects the water supply, groundwater is depleted, it is so critical that we utilize our irrigation water efficiently. An example of why we should utilize our water resources efficiently as possible is our droughts that uh, persist throughout Texas. The last two years we've been in a drought and it looks like based on this drought outlook map for 2013 that drought will persist. It's important to stay informed on drought conditions and utilize your water resources as efficiently as possible. We're going to go through a few steps in designing, developing, and utilizing irrigation in agricultural production. Step one is to locate and develop an irrigation water source. Uh, here I have four pictures of potential water sources that agricultural producers can utilize. One is municipal water supply, and that can be an expensive proposition for agricultural production and should only be considered in the absence of other available sources. Another source that's common used is pond water. A uh, pond is surface water and most of uh, the water utilized in Texas is probably from surface waters that is used by the municipal water supply. Another source is groundwater that is an important resource to utilize here in North Texas that can be limiting primarily because of the cost to install and because of the potential for being unsuitable for irrigation use. Rainwater harvesting is an important source to consider. Capturing water off roof lines, especially when you have a large roof line off a barn, the limiting factor there is storage capacity. When considering utilizing a rural or municipal water supply, it's important to consider the fact that a backflow preventer is needed. Whenever utilizing an irrigation system in agriculture or residential, you must use a backflow preventer. This helps to protect the water supply from being contaminated by the irrigation system. And considering that many agricultural producers utilize fertigation units, we wouldn't want to inject any fertilizers and have the opportunity for that fertilizer to get into the water supply. Groundwater in North Texas is primarily from the woodbine aquifer. The woodbine aquifer can be very deep, up to 2,500 feet deep. A maximum thickness is 700 feet, and if you're in the down dip part of the aquifer and your water source is available below 1,500 feet, uh, the quality of the water deteriorates rapidly. Essentially, the sodium contents is so high in that region of the aquifer that it's unsuitable for irrigation purposes. Here's a map of the aquifer that shows the results of some sampling of wells throughout the aquifer. And it shows that the orange and red uh, dots, those locations are unsuitable for irrigation purposes because of the total dissolved salts are so high. So why would we consider collecting rainwater? First of all, rainwater is a high quality source of irrigation water. If we were to take this scenario of uh, calculating how much water we could capture off a 2,000 square foot roof line. If we had one inch rainfall, we would capture 1,200 gallons. And considering that average rainfall for Dallas is 35 inches, we can capture a potentially 42,000 gallons of water per year on average. And so it's worth considering rainwater harvesting as a source for irrigation. This map shows the potential for rainwater harvesting throughout the state of Texas. The lines represent the average annual runoff in thousands of gallons from a typical 2,000 square foot roof. This just shows that throughout the state of Texas, there's a significant amount of water that can be captured through rainwater harvesting. There are a variety of different ways to collect water. Rain barrels are commonly used by homeowners and residents to capture rainwater. They can be decorated in order to make them look more aesthetically pleasing. 
but in agricultural production we want to capture as much water as possible and large tanks are needed in order to capture a significant amount of rainwater. Our large metal buildings that are typically found at farms offer a great way of capturing that water. Taking water and diverting it into a tank through the gutter system is an excellent way to capture water uh, for agricultural production. Tanks don't necessarily need to be above ground, they can be below ground, and this is an example of a large tank that's partially placed underground to reduce the visual impact on the building. All rainwater harvesting systems do need an overflow pipe that allows water that's collected beyond the capacity of the tank to be allowed to overflow. Once we've located a source of water, it's important to test it and determine the quality and capacity of that irrigation source. Water testing is great in, in determining whether or not you have salts or sodium content that would make it unsuitable for irrigation. If the sodium or salt content is between 0 and 300 parts per million, that's ideal. Uh, most crops will handle 300 to 600, but anything over 600 should be used with caution over 1,000 should be avoided. Some critical elements to, to look at are sodium chloride, also our sodium absorption ratio, which is a ratio of the soil's damage caused by the sodium from the water. It's important to look at the capacity of our water source. Good rule of thumb is you need at least seven gallons per minute per acre. It's important to look at determining the pressure of your water source, what the flow rate is, in gallons per minute. If you're using a municipal water source, uh, to take a look at your meter, that can be an easy way to determine your flow rate from your water source. It also can be a limiting factor uh, because of the size of the meter. If you need to utilize a lot of water, you may need a larger meter installed. Again, water testing is important in determining the suitability of water. Some major factors are salinity hazard, uh, which is the electric conductivity of the water, and is an indication of potential plant damage caused by the irrigation water. Sodium hazard is determined by the sodium absorption ratio, which indicates the potential for damage to the soil by sodium. Toxic ions are also important. Some plants are sensitive to high levels, and it's important to uh, determine if your water source is high in these ions. Here's an example of a water sample form that comes from the Soil Water Forage Testing Laboratory at Texas A&M. You can download this form from the soiltesting.tamu.edu website as well as other forms. Once you've collected that water sample and sent it in for testing, here's an example of what a typical water test may look like. The bar chart on the side gives you an indication of whether the water is acceptable for irrigation in the different categories. In this, we have the SAR value circled because it is significantly high, very limiting as a water source. This was from a well taken in Allen, Texas, and the SAR value of 78 is much higher than anything that's acceptable for irrigation. And unfortunately, this well was drilled at great expense and was not able to be used. Step three is decide on what delivery system you may use. Highly recommend using drip irrigation because it is the most efficient use of your water resource. The sprinkler system is very inefficient simply from the fact that the, it's influenced by evaporation and wind and can waste a tremendous amount of water. Drip irrigation is very efficient. 95% of the water is delivered right where the plants need it at its roots, so every drop counts. Modern drip irrigation tubing is very efficient and can supply the plants with water very accurately. Many of the new drip tubing have inline emitters. Those emitters are pressure compensated, meaning that you have the same flow rate at each emitter along the line. Drip irrigation is the most efficient irrigation method. The irrigation systems are readily available and easy to install. It does take a little bit of knowledge in designing the system, but once you've got it designed, it's pretty easy to put together. And drip irrigation does reduce uh, water loss due to evaporation and runoff. Uh, it reduces the leaching of water and nutrients below the root zone and does save you money. Drip irrigation can be used on a variety of different crops in a variety of different ways, from point source irrigation to inline emitters. Depends on what type of crop that you're trying to grow and where you need the water.
Drip irrigation can be even installed below the soil surface through subsurface drip irrigation and it can be an efficient way of utilizing the system because the water is not affected by evaporation at the soil surface. It is probably not recommended for a soil that has a high sand content, soil that has a heavy clay or sandy loam soil uh, where you have capillary action that can pull the water up to the soil surface is suitable for subsurface drip irrigation. When installing uh, your drip tubing, it doesn't take a lot of tools. You need a cutter that can cut the tubing. You need fittings and adapters to put the system together, but can be pretty easy, just like Tinker Toys. It's important to utilize an irrigation controller. Keep in mind that our run times on drip irrigation can be hours long, so you need to utilize an irrigation controller that is designed for a drip system so that you can have long run times. There are simple egg timers and digital hose bib timers that you can use, but the best system is going to be something that utilizes electronic control valves out in the field. When you want to determine the, the run time of the system once it's installed, uh, it's important to figure out how many gallons per minute that each emitter is uh, putting out. Run the system for 30 minutes and test for depth and spread of that irrigation water. Uh, we want to try to achieve 6 inches deep of water in the soil, and so that's important to consider. The next step is to select a pump. When utilizing a municipal water supply, a pump may not be necessary. In utilizing a well water supply or surface water or rainwater harvesting, a pump will be needed. It's best to seek the advice of a professional when selecting and sizing a pump so that it is selected for the, your particular use and system design. It's important to consider in step five the selection of a filtration system and there's a variety of filtration systems and it's probably best to seek the advice of a professional in selecting these. Keep in mind if you're utilizing drip irrigation that you're going to need to make sure that you don't have any debris that's going to plug those emitters. So it's best to have a series of different filters throughout the system to take out all the debris. Step six is to select a fertilizer injector. If you're utilizing soluble fertilizers, you can inject that soluble fertilizer into the drip irrigation system to apply it to the plant throughout the growing season. This can be an efficient use of fertilizers in a production system, and it's important to consider your options for utilizing this. But keep in mind to always utilize a backflow preventer so that you don't contaminate the water supply. In step seven, uh, we're assembling the irrigation system. So it's important to come up with a design so that you can properly and efficiently design the system and reduce the cost by only purchasing the items necessary to construct the system. Here's an example of a system that's been put together. Uh, you have your pressure regulators, you have your filters, you have your fertilizer injectors, you have a variety of different shutoff valves, check valves, and uh, your hose bibs, and then your main line going out to the field. Here's an example of irrigation valves and meters that are being utilized for drip irrigation. Uh, they're installed below the ground uh, so they're not run over and uh, this can be an efficient way of uh, getting the, the water out to the field. Uh, when utilizing more of a temporary system where most of the parts of the system are above ground, you can utilize a flexible header supply line and then uh, puncture and install a feeder tube that goes out to the drip tape. Uh, this can be an effective way when we don't want to install any permanent systems. An important consideration in designing your system is pipe sizing. It's important to consider that larger pipes are able to flow more water, and so we don't want to undersize the main line and the drip tubing. And so here's some tips or rules of thumb for pipe sizing. It might be worth talking to an irrigation supplier to get some advice on how pipes size uh, restrict flow and pressure in the system so that you can design this system properly. This gives an example of subsurface drip irrigation. A picture on the left is only one tubing. A picture on the right is two tubings. And it's important to consider that wetting pattern that you're going to create. A lot of this depends on what type of crop you're planting, your plant density, etc. 
Step eight is scheduling your irrigation system for optimum yield and cost. It's important to consider utilizing uh, moisture meters to determine if your irrigation system is, is functioning properly, if you're applying a sufficient amount of water and frequently enough. You may consider utilizing a weather station or some type of ET controller that provides information on evapotranspiration rate. That can be an efficient way to determine when you need to schedule an irrigation system. Here's a variety of resources that are available in helping you with your irrigation system. Check these out. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave comments in the box below and we'll try to answer any questions or comments that we have on this YouTube video. I appreciate your attention. Hopefully you've benefited from this video. Let us know if we can do anything to help. Thank you very much.